I want to preach the simple thought, the right place at the right time. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. We're going to read a few verses, then we'll skip down and read some more. Verse 7. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also is the, in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now I want you to skip down to verse 15. Verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. The Lord God said, it is, it is not good that man should be alone. I'm going to take the, word, I'm going to take the Lord's word for it and what he says here. That it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. And out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every on a and every uh, fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not a helpmeet for him. The Lord God caused his deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, shall cleave unto his wife. They shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So what we see is uh, that God, whether you realize this or not, those that have studied and read the Bible a lot, um, you, you know this, and I believe you probably already recognize it, whether I've ever told you this or not, but God has patterns. He establishes patterns um, that what is... What is true in the Old Testament, even as far back as Genesis, and the way in which God operates and the way he likes to orchestrate things and order or ordain things is really setting up an understanding that you can follow throughout all of Scripture. Um, now, it may have a different uh, format. It may have different characters. But you can typically go back and see that this is really what God had, how he had established things all along. We know that the Bible uh, is full of types, uh, shadows, or foreshadowing. We know that there are characters in the Bible that were a type or a picture of Christ to come. Uh, Joseph just being uh, one example of that, or, or Isaac. Uh, we can see that they were a type of Christ, but none of them being Christ. Let me just stop there and say that. None of them being the Messiah. But it was God teaching us lessons or teaching his people in preparing for what the Messiah or the Savior was to be. Amen. And now we can look back and through applying what we know of Christ to those that were before is in the same way that we can look back to the Old Testament Scripture and begin to see and establish uh, order and, and patterns to the way in which God likes to do things. It is establishing consistencies. And how many would agree that if anything, if nothing else, God is consistent. Amen. He does not change. So even though the earth or the world at the time in which we are reading, two chapters into Genesis, obviously very early on in the uh, the uh, the creation aspect or the formation really aspect. We know that the earth was without form and void and then God began to speak and he created 
and he organized and and uh, took things out of, of nothing or he separated the water and the land. He heaped up mountains. He created seas. All that God did in time of creation that he also created man and woman. And so even though at this time in scripture, the world and the earth is nothing like it is today, as far as what we are establishing here is a time in the garden. And I hope you all understand, we are not living in the garden of Eden today. What God had created was a place of, of, uh, of serenity and, and really, uh, you might say, I, I, I know that the, the serpent, the enemy certainly came and, and tricked um, uh, Eve and Adam. But the fact is that it's still in the way that God created, it was perfect, yeah. right? Sin had not yet entered into the world or disobedience had yet not entered into the world. God had created this garden. He had created mankind and he gave them simple instruction. You can eat all of this, but you can't have that. Now, how many know that that is very hard for all humans to keep their hands off of. Sometimes there are things in the house and I think I can have all of that, but I want that one thing that Bethany or the kids brought in and it's just like, anybody else ever do that? Like there's one piece of cake left. I can have anything else that I want, but if I eat that piece of cake, from Union Mills, then Bethany or Noah are going to be really, really angry. I mean carnal angry. And so I can have everything else. But they also know that, listen, if there's just a little bit of, of, of Carter's left, fortunately, they don't really like leftovers. So whatever's left is all mine. And if anybody else puts their grubby little hands on it, they're going to get smacked. You can have everything else, but keep your fingers off of my leftover pizza. He's saying you can have everything else, but you can't have this. He's establishing what his, his command. And by the way, I am, it's been a long, long time. I, Mark and Debbie, and, uh, these other preachers, I don't know if you've... Uh, it's been a long time. I, I, used to, uh, I can remember trying to study and learn more about what it was about this, this tree of knowledge. And really, it just seemingly comes down to simply obedience to the word of the Lord. Amen. Don't do this. See, we don't talk so much about what it was that they ate or what, what the tree actually was or what the tree will actually be. Or if, you know, is there another tree? Is there going to be a tree? Is there a replica tree? When we get to heaven, it's going to be similar to the garden. There'll be this and that. And I don't know any of those things, but I know one thing. What happened was God said not to do it, and they did it, and sin entered into the world. And so this world that they're in, even though it's, it's nothing like what we see today, we know that God is establishing a pattern and how he likes to do things and how he will operate. And I'll ask you a question. What if we truly strive to operate the church after the pattern of God? What if we truly operated our personal lives, our homes and our families after the patterns of God? See, this is part of the creation story. You don't have to raise your hands, but I'd ask you this question. How many believe in the literal creation story? I believe in literal creation story. And I know that the world thinks that it's silly. And I know they say that it's, it, it, you know, that, it, that there's no way and that it's a fairy tale. But I believe everything that we have recorded in the book of Genesis to be true. Amen. I believe every story. I believe that a little shepherd boy took a sling and a stone and killed a giant. Amen. Amen? Yes. Sure. I believe that Moses stood at the Red Sea and when he raised his hands and he put out that staff, I believe that God parted the Red Sea and millions of people walked across on dry ground. I believe it literally happened as sure as I'm standing in front of you. I believe that Jonah was swallowed by a great fish or by a whale or whatever you want to call it. I believe that it literally happened. 
I'm starting to have my doubt if you literally believe these things. And our friend Cal Ray said, not only do I believe that Jonah was swallowed by a whale, if the Bible said that a gnat swallowed the whale, I'd believe that too. Yes, yes. If, the, if the word says it, then I believe it. Amen. And part of this creation story is that they were in a place and God created man and he created woman. And in this utopia, so to speak, or in this place of perfection and without sin, it was God's will and God's design that they were there to enjoy it. And I want to preach just for a moment before I even get into my points is that I believe that God wants us to enjoy the lives that we have. I know that there are times when it gets difficult and we've heard testimonies this morning and sometimes the cars don't run and sometimes we do go through dark times and sometimes we lose those that are closest to us and most if not all of us have been through those times and I understand and I'm, I'm no different than anyone else but through all of that. I'm not saying it's God's will that we all be millionaires. I'm not saying it's God's will that we all live to be 200 years old. But Nick, I do believe that God wants us to enjoy the blessings and the peace and the joy of God that we've got the greatest thing this world has ever known. And we found something that can bring a peace and a contentment and a joy down inside of us to know that we are a child of the living God and be happy about this life. Christians ought to be the happiest people on this Amen. earth. Amen? Yeah. They ought to be. They're not always, but they should be. I gotta move on. And so in the right place at the right time and following and beginning to establish a pattern in what God does, number one, we see in verse eight, he planted a garden. He planted a garden. Verse 8 says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. God planted a garden. Now, I told you not too long ago, those who were here, I'm not going to repeat and embarrass myself about why I, don't, I haven't planted a garden. I don't know if any of you remember why I said. Partly is because we lived down here and everybody came up and down that hill would see how terrible it looked. I'd be embarrassed by it. So I may just go up on Newland Ridge where nobody can see and I'll plant me a little garden up there and see how it turns out. If I figure that out, I'll come down here and you all can see it. Matter of fact, you can stop and walk around and look at it and gaze upon it if you want to. But the Bible says that God planted a garden. Now, this is not necessarily just what we would have a, a vegetable garden, so to speak, or what, what you would plant as a garden. The word garden's got a lot of different meanings, but we do know that there were plants and trees there that produced food, obviously. We know that it was, it was such in that type of garden, but we also know that God came there and walked with them in the garden. And so there are gardens that are nothing but for beauty. There are gardens that are for beauty, gardens that are for food, and gardens that are for spending time, walking, paths, so to speak. I believe it was all those things that God created this garden. Now, all gardens can be a little bit different. My vegetable garden would be much, much different than yours because I don't like very many vegetables. So there's a lot of things you put in your garden I don't want in my garden. And I don't want to raise it just for fun. I want to raise it just to eat. And so if I don't like it, I don't want it there. I don't know everything that was in the garden, but I know everything that was in the garden was good. And I don't have time to preach on these. I kept finding these little sermons. But everything that was there, Nick, was good. Because, because everything that was there was designed by God and planted there and put there for a reason. I got to move on. We know that it was a place of beauty. It was a place of peace and a place of provision. It was a place to enjoy. It was a place to live. And it was a place to spend time with God. We see that it is a uh, establishing a pattern that he plants a garden. And I believe that in our lives that that's exactly what God wants to do. He wants to plant a garden, a place that he will provide for us 
a place he will spend time with us, a place that we can enjoy, a place of beauty. And how many knows that it is beautiful to dwell in the presence of God, whether it be in the church or in the home or in the car or on the lawnmower or wherever it is, in the closet or by the couch, by the bed, walking down the hall, walking around the house, walking at the track, wherever it is that we spend time in the presence of God. It is a beautiful place to be. And just like they walk with God in the cool of the day, I want to walk with God in the garden of my life. I want a place that only God has created, a place that only God can, has established, a place that only God can come and help me to maintain. I want in that garden of my life. And he planted a garden for them. But listen, there were rules to the garden. And God, remember, we're establishing patterns. If we believe that God created a garden, then he can create a garden within us or for us in our lives. Then we also have to know that God has not changed. There were rules in that garden. Even in a life of perfection and a life of, of total and perfect peace, God said, don't do this. And the greatest problem we're having in the church in 2022, not just Life Team Church, but all churches, is that people refuse to be governed by the word of God that whatever thus saith the Lord, God said that's sin or that's not allowed. And so we just want to change what we believe or change what we'll accept or change what we'll believe to be true. And just as in the garden was back then, it is still today that there are rules to what God has established. And sin cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And so for us to, to, to say, to claim, to think that we're going to make heaven our home, then we must be covered by the blood of Christ that our sins have been atoned for. Now listen, I, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know we make mistakes. I know there are times that we, we fall short. We, we have sins of, uh, uh, of omission. We have, we have things sometimes we just didn't maybe do what we knew to do. I get all of that, and I, I know that God's grace is sufficient. I also understand that when we come to him and we are born again, God does not set out on a trail then to try to keep us out of heaven. And sometimes I think when I was growing up, not necessarily my pastors, but just in general, sometimes it seemed like that's the way preachers preached. Like God was trying to keep us out instead of getting us in. Like he was just trying to find everything wrong and damn us and, and destroy us. And, and that's the way they made God seem. No, God is saying, I'm trying to do everything I can to help you. I'm trying to do everything I can to pull you in to the family and into the kingdom of God. And so, but there are rules. And what was sin then is still sin today. The things that we know that the world has just has just set out and just bound and determined. They're, they're going to change the hearts and the minds of people and the rules. But fornication is still wrong. It's still sin. Well, I hope somebody say amen. Yeah. Still wrong. And people, I know, I know people get really uncomfortable because, they, you know, they start saying, well, listen, you know, I made some mistakes in the past. Who hasn't made mistakes in the past? Are you kidding me? If all of us preachers and teachers and everybody else quit preaching on sin because we did it, what would we ever preach on? I'd say between all of our people here, we've covered about all of them, maybe short of shooting somebody. Boy, I feel the Lord. I mean, there are just very few sin, I would say, that hasn't been covered by a multitude of people here this morning. Shame on you. And shame on me. But just because I've got something in my past doesn't mean I can't stand up and tell people, listen, I can, I, yes, I've fallen short. And yes, I've got that sin in my past. But I want to tell you, that's why I'm shouting from the hilltops. Stay away from it. Because I know the destruction that it can run in your life. Stay away from it. Don't let it destroy you. Because I've stood where on the edge of where you're standing. Oh, Many times we, we let our past get a hold of us and say, well, you can't stand up here and tell people that that's sin and it's wrong. 
They'll say, who are you to, who are you to judge? I'm not judging anybody. I'm telling you what thus saith the Lord. And, and, and sexual sin and fornication and adultery are things that are destroying our country. And it's, it, we've got our eyes. The church has fixed its eyes on homosexuality and LGBTQ and trans and all of that. And we're good on our high horse and we're preaching all that. And yet the church itself is full of sin and sexual sin. And because nobody will stand up and say it's wrong. Living together and, and, and entering into a sexual relation between man and woman and they're not married is still sin. There are rules. Those are just a few. We want to preach liberty and we want to preach grace and I believe in it. But it doesn't come without expectation from the word of God. Years ago, I first went to pastor at Smith Chapel. I was up on a Sunday morning preaching. I was probably about 29 years old because I hadn't been there very long. That's how old I was when I went to pastor. I was preaching one Sunday morning, and uh, I don't know if I had my notes or the Lord was just bringing it to my mind. I was I'm beginning to talk about divorce. And uh, the, the, the message was that oh, if you've been a divorce, you know, if you've been divorced and you got no place in the church, or if you've been divorced, you can't go to heaven, that wasn't the message at all, okay? The message was simply this, that it's never God's will that people go through that. It's just as simple as that, right? I mean, that's not what he designed. There are times where situations come that make it unavoidable, right? There are reasons uh, where, where in some cases somebody has to, just, you know, may have to say, I cannot do this anymore for, because of fear, because of well, just whatever, right? I'm not, I'm not up here to, uh, to, to judge every single case, right? But here's what happened. I was 29 years old, and even though I preached a lot of places, I'd, I'd had a lot of revivals and things by then, the majority of my preaching had been done at my home church at the time, which was Beach Fork. And Beach Fork at the time had, I don't know, 250 people or something like that on Sunday morning. Well, trust me, when you get up in front of 250 people and you preach on things like that, nobody feels like you're talking to them. And so you just preach whatever you want and everybody says amen. You just go on about your business. All of a sudden, I was looking at about 79 people and my eyeballs was going to everyone and that I knew had been divorced. And so I'm like, and all that was the first time I'd ever been conscious of what I was preaching and how somebody might take it. Even though I was in no way, absolutely in no way, casting judgment or on their situation or whatever happened, not at all. The point was, you know, again, that, that avoided all costs, you know, pray beforehand and, and try to keep Christ in the center and all that kind of stuff. So sometime later, I, and I'm sure nobody there thought anything about it other than me. Sometime later, I, I came back to that thought. It may have been months later. And here I remember saying, if I ever preach on it, here's what I want you to understand. And again, this is just one, this is just one example, okay? Do you like being made uncomfortable? When I'm, am I making anybody uncomfortable besides me? But when you preach on something like that and you use the word divorce, then the people that have been divorced get really awkward and uncomfortable. And what I want people to understand is this. If that's you, then you ought to be the one that stands up and says amen. Because I know the hurt that it causes. I know the hurt that it caused my kids. I know the hurt that it caused other people. And so when you've been through something, it's not about the preacher judging you. It's about you saying, amen, 
I know what that did in my life. And I want to stand up and tell those you don't want anything to do with that. So you pray and stay in the center of God's will. And you and your spouse stay in the center of God's will. And if both of you will stay in the center of God's will, it takes two. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. It takes two. And if both of you will stay in the center of God's will, then it'll never be anything that you'll have to worry about. But I'm going to here to tell you, we are all, all. Amen. Say A-L-L. Say it. A-L-L. We are all subject to fall. Unless we keep our hearts where they ought to be and our lives in the center of God's will. Well, I'm going to move on before anybody leaves just for pure uncomfortableness. He planted a garden. It's God that plants a garden. He provides and he sets the rules. Number two, it says he put a man. He put a man. It says there he put a man in verse 8. You are where God has placed you. You are where God has placed you. Now I understand, as I just said, that may change. That will, if you follow God's will, he may move you at some place in your, in your point in your life. We've heard mention about he may move what church you're in. He'll never move you from this church. You're out of God's will if he moves you out. No. He may move you from what church you're in. He may move you from what job you're in. There are certain He may move you from what city or town or county or whatever that you live in. He may change those things. But it will always be that God has placed you. He has put you in the garden. He has put you in his will. Stay in that place. And some will say, well, Mick, that's not what happened. They didn't stay in the garden. You're right, they didn't stay in the garden. But what happened in the garden wasn't God's will. They had to leave the garden and they had to go out and, and then begin to populate the earth. But that's not what God intended. Do you understand that if God would have gotten what God wanted, that they would still be in the garden? They would have still been in the garden today. Stay where God places you. And it's not only is it there he put a man, but it says whom God formed. None of us is perfect, but we are perfectly made for his will. None of us are perfect, but we are perfectly made for his will. None of us are perfect. So there are things about Bethany that I love, I absolutely love. And there are things about Bethany that I I, I less than love. I don't hate, but I less than love. I, I greatly tolerate. Bethany's very, extremely independent. And which makes her not always, you know, soft and cuddly in that, you know, she needs me. Unless there's a mouse or it's dark, right, or she tore something up. And so if I was to stand back and say, well, you know, I wish she was more like this. I wish she was more this way. I wish she was more that way. What I have to understand is when she takes off and goes to Columbus to do something and she doesn't need me to drive her, like, and no offense, okay, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not putting anybody down like some of you ladies do. Like your husband has to go with you. He has to take you because there's no way you'd ever go by yourself. That would drive me nuts. I'm so glad. She's the way that she is. You see, she doesn't need me to hold her hand all the time. So therefore, she doesn't want me to hold her hand anytime. <laughs> my, my point is, there's nothing ever perfect. And I'm sure she would say the same thing about me. There are things that make me uniquely me that at the same time drive her crazy but also that she loves. My point is this to you, is that God put a man, a person, 
And he's put you where he's put you. And he has uniquely designed you to be who you are. It doesn't mean we can't get better. It doesn't mean that, oh, we've got this terrible habit about ourselves. You know, we're mean or we're short with people. And say, oh, it's just how God made me. God didn't make you hateful. You and your carnality and the devil made you hateful. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your uniqueness of who you are. That nobody is perfect, but yet we're perfectly made to be in the place that God has placed us. i got to move on. And lastly, not only did he plant it in a garden and he put a man, there's a place and a purpose for all. And I'll just read this briefly. Verse 15. It says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. He, he had a job, a very, very specific job. Not a king. See, it's, it's interesting. You have to read this understanding when this took place in Bible history. He didn't make him a king. This isn't David. He didn't make him a prophet. He didn't make him, any, he didn't make him a preacher, an evangelist, a singer, any of that. There was no need for evangelists, preachers, singers, or, you know, in, in what we know at that time. It was perfect. So what did he make him? He made him a groundskeeper. He made him a groundskeeper. He made him something. He made him a trustee. He made him a trustee of the garden. But it was where God wanted him to be, doing what God wanted him to be doing. I would submit to you this morning, the most important thing we can be is not a preacher or not a pastor or not anything specific, but to be what God has called us to be. He'll give you a job in the kingdom and a place to do it if you're willing to work Amen. and if you're willing to stay in the garden and if you're willing to submit and be obedient to him. As we stand this morning,